Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. In today's video we have an absolutely brilliant presentation by esteemed astrologer Gray Crawford titled Points of Destiny Using the Lots of Diamond and Fortune. Some of you may be more familiar with the terms part of fortune and spirit. And lastly, if you wish to view our current class workshop and webinar offerings, please visit keplercollege.org. And without further ado, let's get into the video. Gray is a natal, horary, and electional astrologer from Olympia, Washington. Gray brings a relational approach to astrology using techniques drawn from ancient and modern sources, synthesizing influences from Hellenistic, magical, mythical, archetypal, and psychological astrology. Gray has taught at UAC, Norwak, ESAR astrology conferences, and various astrology associations around the United States. Gray's astrolog astrological writings have been published on astrology.com, in Wellbeing Magazine, and by Ignota Press. Gray can be contacted on his site, graycrawford.net, where he also writes astrology articles and offers astrological education. So Gray, I'm so delighted to introduce you again today, and I'm going to pass on the baton to you. Great. Well, thank you for um, hosting me, Calum, and everybody else here at Kepler College who has um, invited me to speak. My topic today is the points of destiny using the lots of diamond and fortune in your astrological practice. These um, really are major points of destiny that working with the lots of diamond and fortune, as well as other techniques that are um, associated with them, such as the timing techniques, the diaco releasing, which I'm not going to really talk about today, but I will bring up later how I am teaching a course next month about this in zodiaco releasing. And to basically work with zodiaco releasing, you have to understand the lots of diamond and fortune because that technique basically animates them and creates these, you know, sequences of time structures. Um, and these are really fundamental um, to who we are, you know, why are we here? What is our character? What is the nature of our soul? You know, what is the intention um, that we have um, from a place of soul? And how does that intersect with reality and this interconnected web of all these various, you know, innumerable causes and relations and various inter um, influences that we experience in life. This um, object that I just put on the title screen is going to relate to some of the first topics we we talk about. Um, you know, the lots sometimes can be a little bit abstract to people, and, and I'm going to get into talking about that. They are mathematical points. Um, so in a, in a certain sense, they are imaginal. There's not an object out there moving around in the sky in a, in a concrete sense, but it is a object moving around us that is about the relation, relationship. And it's about the relationship between the sun and the moon. And there are figures um, in culture and history that relate to these points. Um, this object is maybe from the first century BC up to like first century CE. So definitely right in that ferment of Hellenistic astrology and, you know, the cosmopolitan Alexandria city and all these cultures mixing all together that creates Hellenistic astrology. Um, it's a gold bracelet and you see these two serpents that at the bottom, you know, are coming together in this Heraclean knot. And these are basically um, the Agathos Daimon and Agatha Tyche, or good Daimon, good fortune. These deities that are actually associated with the lot of Daimon and the lot of fortune. And in the middle, we have Aphrodite, as well as an Isis, Fortuna, sometimes called Hermuthis, and other names um, that we're going to get into here. And so right, right away, like, you know, somebody having an, an object like this, you know, it, it possibly could be a talisman or just a beautiful piece of um, jewelry. And, and these, you know, these are deities that are associated with having a good destiny and being, you know, fertile and having um, good prosperity in your life. I will 
get into this later about, you know, how to calculate um, the lot of Daimon and Fortune. But the first thing, if you're unfamiliar with these concepts, these two glyphs on the left are the ones that are really most commonly used today. The one on the bottom um, is used for the lot of Daimon. Um, I believe that came out of partially Project Hindsight and then advocated very strongly by Chris Brennan. Um, you may typically, you, you may be more familiar with hearing about the Lot of Daimon um, with the translation Lot of Spirit, which is also my understanding that was a Project Hindsight um, decision. You might be familiar if you, with the work of Abu Mashar, um, if you're familiar with the work of uh, Dr. Ali Olami, who has a really amazing Patreon. Um, this also gets, gets um, translated as the Lot of the Hidden and other variations of that. The Greek term is daimon, and I much prefer using um, the term Lot of Daimon, which I'll explain for, for uh, why here in a moment. But just to, at the outset, again, if you're unf I know some of you are very familiar with this, these topics, some of you may be unfamiliar. When we're talking about the lot of fortune, we, we really are talking about everything that is associated with the material realm, you know, our reputation, prosperity, our health, um, our bodily passions. It's very material, it's very tangible. Whereas the lot of daimon, you know, the reason this could be spirit or, you know, the lot of the hidden is this is the immaterial, you know, intangibles. It's that underlying character or soul nature, um, the intentional mind we have, um, what arouses us and animates us to take action. Even later, you know, in, in 20th century and people like Carl Jung that developed depth psychology and these things based upon the unconscious and that power of the unconscious. We're, we're talking again here about the daimon really. In Valens, um, in book four, he mentions how the lot of daimon and fortune signify the sun and the moon because the moon is cosmically fate and body and breath. The moon being closest to us constantly waxing and waning, bringing associated with things coming into being, passing away. And so the moon is also very much associated with the body, you know, being a soul incarnated here in a body, day-to-day -day life in the material realm and how we are then, you know, connected to everything else around us. Whereas the sun and being associated with daimon is cosmically mind and spirit through its own activity because it arouses the souls of us to undertake things. It's a cause of action and motion. Um, one of the fundamental concepts here is just thinking about our experience of that sun rising at, at sunrise and animating the world and then culminating overhead during midday and then setting. And in fact, in this Hellenistic era, there are you know well-known Egyptian deities associated with that rising sun, associated with that setting sun, which are sort of the primal spirits, primal creator deities. And this is all coming together here in, in this idea of daimon, you know, distributing, um, transmitting something about a solar quality um, into our being. Um, one of my biggest influences um, in astrology and, and definitely on this topic is um, Dorian Greenbaum. And just to give a little bit of background of where I come from with my um, teachers and astrological education, I've always, um, I, I very much value the work of Dorian Greenbaum, uh, partially because she has an Egyptology background and um, awareness of Egyptian culture. And I think that's a really important component to always keep in mind and uh, bring into how we think about um, Hellenistic astrology, which definitely gets um, portrayed as being very stoic for good reason, because you know lots of the astrologers were stoics, but it's happening in Egypt. And there's this whole Egyptian cultural background that's informing this. And of course, we don't have Hellenistic astrology without Egypt and the temple culture there. So um, it's very important. Um, in addition, while I'm talking about teachers, Demetri George is um, 
one of my really primary teachers and influences in astrology, just in general, as well as this topic. Um, I've also learned from Chris Brennan. I've been in his Hellenistic Astrology course and learned about this topic from him. I have some awareness of Project Hindsight, but Robert Schmidt and Project Hindsight also being, you know, people that are really well known for bringing these concepts into practical use today. Um, I don't have as much um, connection to to them, have not ever learned directly from them. Um, but definitely you'll see lots of things from them because of how much um, Robert Schmidt and Project Hindsight has kind of informed our understanding about these concepts. So Doreen Greenbaum in her book, The Daimon and Hellenistic Astrology, she wrote, um, the daimonic illumines, like the astrological sun and moon, the luminaries who rule sight, physical and mental insight, eyes and foreknowing, which is also known as pronoia. So that's one thing just to start thinking about. You know, we think about the sun and the moon as being the two eyes. Um, even topics and figures like the Agathos Daimon, who I'm going to talk about, was sometimes portrayed as having the sun and moon um, as their eyes. And it's not just, you know, that physical vision, it's that insight, that mental um, soul kind of difficult to um, classify, sort of ineffable um, quality of where all that comes from. The sun and a lot of daimon are instruments of this particular illumination, both signifying pronesis, which may be described not only as understanding, but as intentional mind. The daimon brings us what we already know, which only needs to be brought to consciousness and light, which the daimon can provide. And the more we follow and are encouraged by our daimon, the more our phronesis increases. So this here is talking a lot, coming from a standpoint of, you know, who the daimon is in um, Greek culture. But this concept, especially this idea, the more we follow this, the more we're encouraged by the daimon, the more this understanding, the more we connect with our soul's intentional mind. This is that idea that we can trace this, you know, this goes all the way through the Renaissance and Marsilio Ficino bringing a lot of these ideas back and this idea of, you know, the star of destiny, or there's a reason for you to be here. There's a reason um, you were born connected to the stars and where everything was, you know, and, and aligning with that. What is that um, sense of destiny you have? What is that work that you feel like you're here to do, that you're brought alive by, that you must work at? And by by following that, um, all this deeper understanding opens up. And what this technique also is, we'll talk about, you know, a lot of us have that, that burning passion for something. Some people have that burning passion and it brings them to immense power and wealth and prosperity um, while they're alive. Other people um, struggle with those things, even though they are following that destiny passionately. And they may later become um, very well-known, but not so much in their lifetime. And so this technique is going to help orient us um, into how that works out for people. So what I'm going to do just to start with is, is try to bring Diamond and Fortune alive a little bit. Um, and then we will talk about the, the actual lots and um, how to calculate them, some of the interpretation guidance that goes with that. We'll look at a couple of examples, just talking about Daimon and fortune. And then we're going to talk about the idea of fortune charts or fortune houses. This is where you take the lot of fortune and you make that the ascendant. And many Hellenistic astrologers actually gave the same weight of importance to that as they gave to the Ascendant and the ruler of the Ascendant. We're also going to talk about diamond charts and diamond houses, which is the same thing. You're taking the lot of diamond and you're making that the Ascendant. And then we're going to look at some chart examples, um, bringing all that together. So again, um, the Agatha Taiki, the Agathos diamond, good fortune, good diamond. Around, you know, this is all just very ballpark general circa time periods, but as we get Hellenistic astrology developing more and more, we also have cults to these figures showing up more and more. 
And there's really this syncretism of various deities from Egyptian, Greek, Mesopotamian cultures, just like there's all these cultural mixes within Hellenistic astrology. Um, some of you, particularly those of you that might have any sort of um, folk magic per, uh, practice where you work with, for example, saints, you might be familiar with how certain saints or um, deities of like one religion end up incorporating and embodying deities from all these other different cultures. This is the same type of um, concept that's that's going on here. So the Agathos daimon, known as the good daimon, daimons have a deep history. And at the most basic level, they are um, intermediaries between you know, us as humans, as these souls incarnated in bodies here, and the divine, and the gods, the goddesses. And they um, mediate between our realm and the heavenly realm. Um, Plutarch and others have talked about daimons being um, alive at oracles, daimons helping to mediate messages between um, the or oracular figure, you know, receiving that revelation. Um, there's ways in, in Doreen Greenbaum's book, she talks about even the different types of fate and destiny that are operating and how, um, which the you could say the fixed stars are part of, the wandering planets are another level of, you then have the moon and the whole sublunar realm and the diamonds being part of, you know, mediating this and bringing this down to us. When we talk about these concepts, um, diamond fortune, it, um, it, 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 it really necessitates talking about your belief system. And um, I don't want to put my ideas uh, about that on you, but it does bring up the idea, as, as, as you'll see, as we talk about, you know, there's ideas of things being very predetermined versus different layers of determinism. And, you know, where do we have, you know, free will, where can we make choices and how does this line up with our destiny? And it's, it's very complicated because when we have these, especially when we're talking about this mixture of cultures, there's a certain type of Greek stoic astrologer that can sound extremely predetermined, like everything is going to happen this certain way. And you just sort of have to flow with that and align with that. One of the things I love about Doreen Greenbaum's work is talking about the different sense of fate and destiny that was alive in Egypt and Mesopotamia and how that's actually different. There's still maybe a, a type of determinism working with the, your actions having consequences, but there is a way to um, either some, some, in some cases propitiate, but there is abilities to um, make choices and there are, in fact, different deities, as we'll talk about, that even have, um, can kind of oversee fate. Um, but with the Agathos Daimon, um, the, these, the, the, the good Daimon, it's, at some point, you know, just becomes this, this big figure. And again, it, it very much con coincides with Hellenistic astrology. On one level, this is, we can think about the Agathos Daimon as this very protective, household god who's also then you know connected with a partner agatha taiki and personal fortune um, but beyond even the household you know we're, we're really talking about the sort of genie loki the spirits of um, the land the genius of a place um, again though associated with bringing fortune bringing wealth bringing wisdom the greek term for happiness eudaimonia actually basically means having a good Daimon. And you, a lot, some of you may be familiar with when you know the idea of before drinking wine, you know, pouring a libation on the ground and invoking the um, Agathos Daimon as a blessing. So, some of the evidence um, showing the importance of the Agathos Daimon and this connection to the sun as well as the moon, we can see this in the Greek Madrigal Papyri, which are um, texts and spells taken from, um, you know, temple priests in that Egyptian Alexandria area where Hellenistic astrology is happening. 
Um, this is part of one. It says, come to me, you from the four winds, ruler of all who breathed spirit into men for life, the agathos daimon, you are the ocean, begetter of good things and feeder of the civilized world. Yours is the eternal processional way in which your seven letter name is established for the harmony of the seven sounds of the planets, which utter their voices according to the 28 forms of the moon. So we have here obviously a very solar type of quality, but it's also emanating through these sounds. Um, you can say the songs um, of the spheres and the, the planetary spheres, and it's it's being distributed through the the twenty eight forms of the moon, which are you know basically the lunar mansions, as as that, or the nakshatras, um, as that concept gets developed, that lunar zodiac. Another one. Um, says, rejoice with me, you who are set over the east wind and the world, for whom all the gods serve as bodyguards at your good hour and on your good day, you who are the good daimon of the world, the crown of the inhabited world, you who rise from the abyss, you who each day rise a young man and set an old man, I ask to obtain and receive from you life, health, reputation, wealth, influence, strength, success, charm. Again, we have this idea of, of rising and setting. Um, something I've, I meant to mention, this particular um, spell or prayer invocation here, you are supposed to do um, during the day, you know, when the sun's rising, when the sun's culminating, when the sun's setting. And so there's, there could also be a very much, you know, doing these um, invocations and spells at, you know, in alignment literally with the sun rising and setting. And again, uh, Egyptian temple culture, this goes back to the that, uh, gods of the rising sun and the setting sun. In more the, you know, Mediterranean Greek culture, in the Minoan civilization, which which goes, you know, we're talking Bronze Age, roughly 3000, 1000 BC, there's not a written record that I know of these, um, but they're typically described as being Minoan genie or, or daimons as being these, again, these divine intermary, intermediary figures. And what we see in these, um, on one hand, we can note they, they, there's a similarity of form to some Egyptian goddesses and deities. And we can also see they're always involved with pouring libations or being involved in sacrifices, or again, being these intermediary figures. Um, this is a gold ring uh, with a sitting goddess and a procession of the Minoan genie. Um, Mesopotamia, we have figures like, um, this is a winged genie on the left, which is like 7, 13, 16 BC. On the right, this is a Lamassu. Um, the Lamassu were also just sort of like the Agathos Daimon. They would protect throne rings of kings, but they would also, uh, protect households and, um, were said to even sort of hold within them all the stars and constellations. So again, very much being these intermediary figures. Um, again, going back to the 700 BC area, we have Daimon showing up in Hesiod. And he talks about them really very much as being ancestors. If you think about, if you know that golden age that Kronos was said to rule over, the spirits of that golden race of in the golden age, um, became daimons and watch over us. A little bit later, um, Empedocles, you may be familiar with him, Empedocles and that cycle of love and strife and this constant cycle, um, which going back to that object I showed at the beginning does involve Aphrodite because Aphrodite is said to be there at this sort of perfect blend of love where all the elements, everything is all mixed together in this sort of perfect harmony but then that separates out um, as, as strife comes into um, being more and more. And this is constantly, you know, going through these great cycles of ages when this is happening. And the diamonds emerge as the strife is ascending. And they basically carry within them that perfect blend of elements which existed in that sphere. And they carry this as they're basically separated out into individual entities that then lead into human incarnation. Uh, if you're familiar with the work of Peter Kingsley, he's done some really beautiful work around this and sort of my own interpretation of the way he 
talks about this is sort of like the idea of um, strife and um, that idea of when, when you talk about having a dark night of the soul and you have this difficult experience where you're kind of like thrown back on yourself. It's often during that time that we actually really connect. We're kind of forced to connect back to that um, essence a little bit more, that, that soul essence of ourselves. And there's something about that that to me really resonates with, with that concept. In the Corpus Hermeticum, um, in book 16, there's a chorus of daimons who are described as being placed under the command of the sun. They set in formation under the stars. They're equal to number of them. They, they serve the stars. They can be good and evil in nature. And this idea of um, good and evil in nature, this definitely also shows up in the Egyptian influence of um, the daimons. And there's so much about this that could be said. And um, I kind of went crazy preparing this and realized that I, I don't have time to actually go into all of this. It could easily be a long workshop just talking about this. Um, but a lot of you probably know, you know, one element of diamonds with Egyptian culture is, is them eventually showing up associated with the Deccans. And they could be both protective as well as um, bringing destruction and could be associated with things like um, diseases even. And interestingly, that is something that also then gets connected to the lot of Daimon, that it's not just um, um, the unseen, um, you know, maybe things that we're hoping to have happen to us in our life. It's also, um, you know, it can be either anything from mental illness to diseases, um, all these things that, that, that operate us in, in that way that they're coming from a more kind of hidden source. Um, but there, one figure, the shy is, is particularly important. Um, a God of destiny in that image you see there of the heart being weighed shy is right there in the demotic charts. Um, the name for the 11th place, uh, which basically has a very similar meaning to the good diamond is shy. Shy is typically seen with Renutet or Renanet, um, a goddess of fertility and personal fortune who is, um, a cobra-headed um, sneak goddess, and um, they very much, you know, come together. Um, eventually, often seen to as like an Isis or Isis Hermuthis. There's also a Shepset figure, who's another goddess of good fortune, reputation, this divine protector at birth, and all these things are coming together into that Agatha Tyche figure. Um, and then we we see again, like I mentioned, Hellenistic astrology era. These are our major cults. Um, this image on the left, which is a piece of blue glass at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art has on their site is rather interesting. Um, there's a figure called Serapis in the middle. He was a, a figure that sort of emerges in Hellenistic era. He's associated with the Agathos Daimon. Um, this would be the Agathos Daimon over here. This is like an Isis fortune sort of figure holding a cornucopia. And over here, there's like a Demeter figure with a torch. And um, we have the um, right in that kind of Agathus Tyche figure. And there's all sorts of images we can find um, of them. And then how this then comes into Tyche or who's the goddess of fortune, which is the term we're, we're going to be, which, which is what we use in the Greek. Um, Tyche is mentioned by Hesiod as being a daughter of Tethys and Oceanus, which is very interesting in terms of um, possibly being like an Oceanid, you know, so similar to um, the figures associated with like the Pleiades, for example, um, as well as the Nereids are sort of like their daughters, um, same family, um, other say Zeus. But sometime are sort of around roughly fourth century BC, she becomes this goddess of fortune and luck and chance. And there's this idea of a personal taiki that's sort of like a personal daimon that attends to your fortunes. She's often seen holding a horn of plenty, um, like a cornucopia, which is like the horn of Amathea, who you know nursed Zeus. She's often having a crown. She's often holding a rudder, you know, um, steering your ship through life. 
she's um, there's lots of examples of Taikis who are protective um, deities of cities. Um, this is one for Antioch here on the left. This is a famous um, image of her with a um, zodiac around her, and you can see um, a moon shape there. And this goes, this ties into, this is an image by William Blake to that term that, you know, over time we, we associate with fortune and the wheel of fortune and which can be, you know, both prosperity and things kind of rising up and also things kind of falling down. Um, the fact in this Blake image, you know, there's this idea of like work and, and toil sometimes associated with this. There's a, there's a, you know, we can see some cards and, and dice on the ground, which can um, very much also be connected to the idea of like happenstance or luck or chance. Um, this also then starts turning into the idea of like, like blind fortune and people, you know, cursing blind fortune. Like, why does that other person get this? And I, I don't get that. But as we'll talk about too, if you work in divination and you, you might have your own divinatory system, which, which is random and you're casting things and you're rolling things in some cases but you're doing that also to understand the will of the gods or you know what's going on in that realm what's a message you can pick up so there there's definitely something else about that associated with fortune similar to how i mentioned the agathos daimon in greek magical papyri as an example here's one connecting the moon with fortune um, it says but you mistress selene only ruler, the fortune or taiki of diamonds and gods. So as we, you know, with what, as Hellenistic astrology um, is developed and, and persists, and definitely the way Hellenistic astrology has been um, interpreted by many people as part of you know, bringing it forward today, a massive influence on this is the ideas of Plato. And um, you may know that Socrates, interestingly, who, who was alive during a previous transit of Pluto and Aquarius, and we don't really, I don't think we have a good birthday for Plato, but if you look at the dates and the transit, Plato could have been born with Pluto and Aquarius. But um, you might know that Socrates had this inner voice that he described as being his, his daimon. In his case, he typically described it through the words of Plato as being more about what's holding him back from, you know, doing something. Um, and in other works, um, describes through Plato, Socrates describes daimons as these great intermediary forces connecting the divine with us and guiding us toward the happiness and purpose in life. Um, in the Timaeus, Plato also associated the daimon with a sovereign part of our soul. Um, this divine and, and that's divine and is nourished by our learning and our contemplation. You know, our learning and contemplation, you know, feeds the soul, feeds the daimon. And probably the most influential thing or one of the most influential things with astrology is Plato's myth of air and how all these ideas, you know, kind of come together here. Um, and it's, it's interesting because you may know that the etymology of the Greek word that's used for like a lot um, is actually, it's derived from the shards, maybe like wood or stone or something else that was used to basically cast lots in decision making um, as a way to like know divine will. And, you know, you can think about even in mythology um, with amongst the gods, right? Zeus and Poseidon and Hades are sort of like lots cast to see who's going to realm who's going to rule as which realm are they going to have? Um, same in Mesopotamia with like a new and Enki and Enlil. Um, and this was also done in culture of like everything from like property and certain roles of officials. And that also you may know that the term that's basically used for um, an astrological degree is also basically the same name as the fates, the Morai. And so it's interesting in the myth of Ur, which is all about, you know, what's, what's happens um, when souls are coming down to incarnate into a body. As the souls are preparing to incarnate, they're shown different images of potential lives to live by a prophet. And they then choose their um, incarnation in a particular order. 
And that's determined by them drawing lots that are received by Lachesis, who's one of the um, Moirai. And in this image, we have um, the three fates and they're, they're the daughters of Ananke or Necessity, who's you know sitting here on her throne with her great spindle of necessity around which are the planetary spheres that are revolving. And each one has a siren that's sort of singing the song of that planetary sphere. And, you know, the souls are basically coming down and carnating down through that. Um, and so there's something interesting here in, in this version of things about how the soul is actually um, choosing a life. And when they make that choice based on being shown this like flash of images or however that works, they go to Lachesis and she gives them their daimon. He's basically chosen to be the guardian of their life and the fulfiller of that choice they made. Um, so it becomes this guardian daimon figure. Um, again, very similar in some ways to the idea of like our guardian angel that um, you know is more popularly talked about today. Um, the guardian daimon then leads them to Clotho, who draws them within that spindle of necessity, ratifying that destiny or that morai of each, which again is interesting with that being the interesting use of the astrological degree, which we'll talk about is sort of like, you know, in a way you, you casting that lot from your ascendant in your natal chart and it's falling upon that particular moirai or that particular degree. They are then carried to Atropos who spun the threads and made that choice um, irreversible. Uh, once without turning around, they pass beneath the throne of necessity. Um. And yeah, and it's a it's a I, it's a really um interesting passage. Uh, one of my personal favorites of that story is um, it's said that Odysseus or Ulysses um, kind of wants to choose a life that's not such a big little little bit more laid back. Um, which I, I always love that that's included in that. Just if you imagine the soul of Odysseus was sort of like I I don't need to go through that again this lifetime. So. This idea very much comes though into like what is um, what is a lot, and so you know if you're like me, I there's some people I know they hear about lots and they get really excited. It becomes their primary astrological technique. Um, it just intrinsically, intuitively makes sense to them, and um, they they need no help in understanding, you know, why should I use this? Um, it's obviously extremely mathematical. We're, we're talking about the ratio or the arc distance between two astrological points. And we are then going to project that down um, from the ascendant um, into the chart. And so, you know, unlike if, if you're like me and, and, um, I know some of my initial, like not so sure about the lots when I first heard about them many years ago. Um, it, it's, it's sort of like, that, you know, there's, there's nothing actually there, but, but in a way, you know, if, if you're into the lunar nodes, for example, it's not the same thing as that exactly, obviously, but it's similar in the fact that it's a mathematical calculated point. We're talking about the lunar nodes or the North node or the South node. We're talking about, that relationship between um, the sun and moon with the ecliptic. And that is something that we can actually see in the world because obviously e eclipses happen um, when they when they come by new moons and full moons. And we can watch, we can track the motion of the moon and the moon crossing down the ecliptic and rising across the ecliptic with the lunar nodes. So there, there, even with those, there's something a little bit more um, tangible there. But I th the thing to think about is how this really is um, a relationship between whatever we're, we're creating the lot out of, whatever those planets are, and we're making that a very personal relationship because we're then connecting that into our um, ascendant. The ascendant being that point, that mori, that degree that's rising at our birth. And we have to calculate that you know, with longitude, latitude. It's very much connected to the time, the place, the location of our birth. Um, an idea that I've heard Ben Dyke say that I really like um, that helped me get into this more 
is the idea that this is just like the idea of like casting a lot or doing a method of divination. We're sort of taking whatever this topic is and we're projecting it down from the celestial matter down into the material realm because we're always projecting it down from the chart. So we're going down into the lower hemisphere of the natal chart, which is the material realm. And so they are often associated with a particular planet, like a lot of fortunes associated with the moon and a lot of diamonds associated with the sun, but they're always in different locations. And so they, they basically end up serving as another way, another method to distribute or make allotments, whatever that topic is that's associated with that planet. And they're also very much associated with this realm of Taiki and fortune. Um, in fact, a lot of fortunes called the archetypal lot, which we can, again, think about this sort of web of different causes, influences, relations behind events. They give you know, very specific information about concrete events and experiences we have in our daily life. They are very much more about, you know, um, especially with a lot of fortune, you know, being in the right place at the right time for some event to actually happen. You know, it's not just in your mind, it's actually happening um, very concretely. And there's another way to think about this, I think, um, you know, with astrological programs, and one thing I've thought about too is just we can, with a click of a button, we can get all these lots. If we're hand calculating all this stuff by hand, there's a little bit more involved in that um, with everything because, you, you know, you're really taking all these concepts and you're, you're creating something, you're creating this chart, and, you know, there becomes something very divinatory here, you know, getting the idea, oh, I'm going to cast this lot um, this particular lot um, and cast that down to the chart, you'd have to figure out where it was. Um, it's not just going to, it wouldn't have just shown up um, automatically without having to think about it. Um, one quote from Dorian Greenbaum I really love is she wrote, the lots are points which cannot be seen, but only created in the mind because they are imaginal, not physical. They fall easily into a numinal and symbolic space where the astrologer in their interpretation is able, like the daimon, to mediate between the worlds of gods and humans. So again, the lot of fortune is the lot of the moon, whereas the lot of daimon is the lot of the sun. And as I've already mentioned, you know, fortunes, everything about the material world, prosperity, wealth, passions, um, as well as, you know, in, in good ways, but then also things like injuries. And, you know, same thing with this, with an injury, we kind of know what happened. Um, there's some kind of event that causes an injury, whereas a lot of diamond is more immaterial, what arouses us and animates us, the soul nature, intentional mind. Um, Valens, Vedius Valens also uses them around um, diseases, you know, which, which have, again, much more um, um, hidden causes, you know, any kind of physical or mental disease or illness there's there's something else um operating there that we, we can't necessarily see so what we're doing is we're for fortune and diamond all astrologers for the most part um the only one i know of that doesn't do this is, is ptolemy but one thing that you do have to take in consideration is whether it is a day chart or a night chart if it is a day chart with a lot of fortune, we're taking that arc distance by degree, so counting from the sun to the moon, and we're projecting that down from the ascendant. If it's a night chart, we're taking the distance from the moon to the sun and projecting that from the ascendant. Whereas for daimon, we're taking the distance from the moon to the sun from the ascendant. And if it's a night chart, we're taking the distance from the sun to the moon and projecting that from the ascendant. Um, one idea that um, Chris Brennan, I, I don't know if he's the first person that, that talked about this, but definitely the person um, I learned about it from, and also somebody that really got me um, more into getting into the lots and understanding them more when I took his Hellenistic astrology course. Um, he talks about we have the symbolism here of light to darkness 
with fortune, whereas Daimon, we're, we're doing something that's more about darkness to light. And this involves um, the fact that we're whether or not we're, we're talking about the sect light of the chart or not. If you are born during the day, the sun is your sect light. If you're born at night, the moon is your sect light. So if by day we're going from sect light to not sect light and vice versa. So that's the idea of going from light to darkness, which is the same idea, sort of like spirit being associated with light, um, darkness being associated with, you know, being incarnated in a body. And if you're born during the day, I mean, one of the easiest ways to start, if, you, if you're unfamiliar with doing this, is you're probably already familiar with your, your lunar phase you're born with, which is just, you know, calculated from your sun to your moon. So if you're a day chart, just taking that lunar phase calculation is going to be basically, and projecting that down from the ascendant is going to be your lot of fortune. Um, whereas at night, um, that's going to actually end up being the lot of daimon, which makes sense in a lot of ways, because again, for night charts, the moon actually becomes the sect light um, and is this more powerful light in the chart than the sun. And so it's sort of given that um, you can you can sort of see that in the way this is calculated. Um, and I and again, if 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 it just all sounds too mathematical for you, um, I I think you really just just feel into imaginally or however you need to. What is that relationship between your sun and the moon, and you know what is that lunar phase? And there's a way that this is an emanating out of the ascendant, you know, this point of life, this, this intersection of soul, spirit, and body. And um, we can see how all of the symbolism is, is basically there. It's, it's there, not only are they in this way, you know, mirrors of our soul and reflecting something about our soul nature and our experience as um, incarnating here in the world, they literally are mirror images of one another. We're going to look at a chart here in just a second. And so they are always, um, the ascendant's always going to be their, their, their midpoint. And so they're always going to be mirroring each other from um, the ascendant. There's a couple of quotes from Dorian Greenbaum I really love about this, um, where she wrote about this, this basically showing that this reciprocal nature of happenstance and intentionality. And that the Hellenistic astrologers would speak of them as if they were variations on a theme or as a mirror images, which they actually are in the chart. The lots of fortune and diamond cannot be astrologically interpreted in isolation from each other. The sun and moon that form them, the happenstance of the time and space, Tai, which is the ascendant that bind them, these create links that forge in astrological language the reflection of reality shown in the chart. The Hellenistic astrologers literally cannot separate body from mind, soul from spirit. And you'll see at times the topics of the lot of diamond, lot of fortune will overlap, especially around things sort of like reputation or you know how well you're doing in that kind of a way. And um you know, at, at some points there, they even talk about, you know, switching them out for different reasons that are not entirely clear in many cases. Um, and I think there's something about that just to embrace, you know, this is not something to get, there's something really um, holistic to, to feel into about how these points cannot be separated. They're all, you know, the diamond on fortune with the ascendant are really forming this, um, this important picture and image to feel into what that says. Um, and sort of with this, you know, I've been talking a lot about, you know, in ways that can be um, positive, a, a quote from Carl Jung that I, I really like when he, in his book, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, and he talks about sort of the challenges he had by um, being overcome um, by the sense of a diamond he said, um, I've had much trouble getting along with my ideas. There was a diamond in me, and in the end, its presence proved decisive. It overpowered me. And if I was at times ruthless, it was because I was in the grip of the diamond. I could never stop at anything once attained. I had to hasten on to catch up with my vision. 
Since my contemporaries understandably could not perceive my vision, they saw only a fool rushing ahead. A creative person has little power over his own life. He is not free. He is captive and driven by his daimon. And so we can see in this statement, you know, that these, these overlapping themes of our, is it choice? How is that coming in with like a sense of destiny and feeling like you have to do this and um, the sense of being sort of driven by this quality. So when you're interpreting them, um, the real basic things to do is you're going to um, always just look, first of all, at the house placement and the sign of that lot. And I definitely do this, especially on this topic with these lots, always use whole sign. You know, if you don't use whole sign, um, you can definitely do whatever you want with that. But my examples are going to be all using whole sign um, because of that. I just feel for me, it works better um, and it's more accurate. Um, but you basically want to look at, you know, what is just that sign? Um, what place is that in the chart? What are the influences on it? What are the, the other planets making aspects to that lot? Are there any other planets in the same sign as that lot? And you want to especially look at, you know, what's making the closest aspect or what's the planet that's closest to it, you know, by degree. You also then want to look and interpret the planet ruling that lot. Um, interpret that essential nature of that planet. You know, is it Saturn? And what does that say about a person? Um they might be um, work hard, be have this very enduring, contemplative personality who also, you know, falls into melancholia. Um, versus someone might be more Mars and can be really enthusiastic, but maybe they, they you know, they, they go to extremes in some ways. You know, whatever that is, um, Venus having this motivating factor of of beauty or love, for example. Um, whatever that planet is, is going to have its own way of animating and arousing action and it's going to reveal aspects of that soul intention and the inner motivations um, but you also need to look at not just you know what planet is it but you know what sign is it is you can look at essential dignity um, what are the aspects on it what location in the chart does it have all these things are going to come together um, and then also like i mentioned aspects to that planet ruling the lot are going to also be important and as we'll talk about, the angular houses to the lot are um, particularly active. And this is especially the case when we're talking about um, angles to fortune. So the first chart I'm going to use is um, Nina Simone. Um, Nina Simone, not familiar with her, she is one of the most famous um, musicians, singers of the 20th century that really created a um, incredibly unique blend of um, different musical forms like folk, jazz, um, classical music. And in her chart, the way that we can see this with, you know, how to calculate them and, and how they form mirror images, is first of all, you, you might notice how and just also, by the way, I had trouble um, getting my solar fire program to put in the glyph for the lot of spirit that you normally see. I, I could only get it to show up as this S, which I kind of like because it looks like a snake. Um, but that's why this is the lot of diamond or the lot of spirit right here. But we can see how they are diamond and fortune are they are equidistant from that ascendant. So that's that mirror imaging quality. We see um, Nina Simone descendant is here in Aquarius. We have the sun down below the horizon. So we know this is then a night chart. Being a night chart, if we're going to do the lot of fortune, we're going to go from the moon to the sun. And we can think, see here, so 23 Capricorn, we go about 30 degrees um, forward into Aquarius, and then um, at about nine or so more degrees, we end up at the, the Pisces sun here. Um, so, you know, around um, 
39 degrees or so is, is, is distance from the moon to the sun. We're then going to basically take that 39 degrees of distance. We're going to add that to the ascendant. We're going to cast that down into the chart. And that is how we end up with um, the lot of fortune being in Pisces in her second house, very close to Mercury. So we have this Mercury in Pisces has a very strong um, influence. Her son, you know, one of her lights is also in the same sign of fortune, um, which is positive. It would be considered, you know, more positive if that was her moon being a night chart. Um, and then, and so, and, and one way sect sometimes gets interpreted is sort of if you have something out of sect, it can sometimes show in this way, we're talking about like soul character, you know, sometimes ways you might work against yourself sometimes, things you kind of self-defeating behaviors at times. Um, this would also be the case with her because that lot of fortune in the sign of Pisces ruled by Jupiter. So it's, it's great. It's ruled by Jupiter. Um, Jupiter's in his own bounds even, but being again, a night chart, um, it's not like the ideal best case scenario when we're doing like planetary conditioning. However, um, more than getting caught up in that, in that right away, I think it's just more important to start feeling into, you know, what does this mean? You know, Pisces, lot of fortune, it's ruled by this Jupiter, um, in Virgo, which is, which we see, you know, Jupiter's in the sign opposite its home. So over here in the eighth house, it's ruled by this Mercury and Pisces. And so we have this, um, mutual exchange of signs, this mutual receptivity between, um, uh, Mercury and Jupiter in the second and eighth houses. Um, she also has Mars, um, close to that Jupiter, Neptune in the South node also being in the same sign of Jupiter is also very extremely um, resonant for her. You may know that her mother is a minister. She grew up, she was a child prodigy with music. She was just, um, as a very young child, her, from a family of musicians. So it was in the air, she, but she was extremely talented at an extremely young age and basically grew up performing at her mom's church and was so talented um, and developed this dream from a very young age of becoming a classical um, pianist, even though she's growing up in the South and she's facing incredible racism and she sort of has everything going against her in that way. She has this dream of being like, I'm going to be the first um, classical music, um, you know, um, performer in this big way and, and kind of break those um, cultural barriers. And she's so talented that the, where she lives, they start, um, accumulating funny funds and money um, basically to pay for her to get private um, lessons as a classical musical composer. And so we see very much that second house, eighth house um, quality coming in there with her. And when we look at Daimon, we see Daimon in the 11th house, which is the house of the good Daimon. So there's very much this, this like good Daimon, um, Jupiterian, quality um, we see coming in there with um, the lot of Daimon, again, also ruled by that very same um, Jupiter. And when we're, when, we're, when we're doing that calculation, again, because she's born at night, in this case, we're going from the sun all the way around to the moon, and we're projecting that all the way around. Although what I do, and probably a lot of you do also, what, I'll, what I typically do is just kind of reverse it or, you know, we, we know there's there's like these um, 39 or so degrees separating them. So we're basically going like 30 degrees up this way and another nine or 10 degrees forward. And that's how we end up right here. Um, I'm going to move on from now to show with time. So another chart, this is a chart of Jim Henson. This is a day chart. Um, Jim Henson, um, Sesame Street, The Muppet Show. If you're my age, you need no introduction. If you grew up in America, because everything was about um, Jim Henson, um, you know, in incredible um, 
not just imagination. This so this is an example of somebody with lots of imagination that was in many ways this you know workaholic, um, and unfortunately you know passed away. He was around like fifty three, and it's sometimes said that if he had maybe gone to the hospital earlier instead of working, you know they could have done something about it. Um, he had a very unfortunate you know death that came about surprising to many people at a much younger age than people were expecting. But, you know, again, we, we have here somebody that not just has big ideas, he, he not just is a talented uh, performer and creative visionary who really brought things into being in a massive way and, um, you know, created this, these, these huge television and film productions that had this huge influence um, upon a whole generation of people growing up at the time. As a qualifier with this chart, um, it's not, we don't have like a, a specific definite somebody's seen this birth certificate. Um, I actually found this birth time just from reading a biography and the biographer like describes this time of birth and describes who's in the hospital and even like the nurse. And it sounds like they have some kind of birth record, but you know, it's not actually shown. But assuming this is the right chart, um, being born at, during the day, when we're doing the lot of fortune, in this case, we're going from the sun to the moon. And so we have a Libra sun, Capricorn moon, you know, we know, okay, this is like a first quarter waxing moon phase, you know, um, the square would be, um, you know, 90 degrees right there. Big early Capricorn, plus we're adding about nine or so more degrees. So you do that, you know, Sagittarius, go down to Pisces, about 12 Pisces, add about nine or so degrees. And we end up with this 22 Pisces um, lot of fortune. And then for the lot of Daimon, which is in Virgo, we're going from the moon all the way around to the sun, casting that all the way around the chart there. So in this case, with a lot of daimon, we see this is in an angular whole sign house to the ascendant. Um, and it's in an angular house to fortune. So it's, it's extremely active relative to fortune. It's also extremely active relative to the natal chart. It's the tenth house. So this sort of right away shows us somebody that you know there's events happening. Jim Henson's gonna, he's gonna be taking action. He's gonna be inspired, and he's he's going to find a way to make these things line up and sort of um, do the impossible. You know, in terms of like bringing you know this love for puppets into this massive you know cultural phenomenon. Um, we see the influence of um, Mercury here with a lot of Daimon. Um, and, then, you know, I know not, not all of you use the outer planets. Um, I, you know, can't help myself. I have to use Neptune and Uranus and Pluto. Um, and I do think that's something to look at real up to this. Um, you know, I've even thought about things like fixed stars, but fixed stars at a really close has, has to be really close to the degree of one of these lots i think that's actually something that you can also in my opinion and, and from what i've looked at so far take into account but even just neptune being in the same sign as daimon um, this is somebody who has this neptunian spirit about them you know they're born at a saturn neptune opposition you know that's not just a saturn neptune opposition it's a t-square with jupiter Neptune and Saturn. Um, and so this is this T square is is extremely active in both the diamond charts. So it's angular to both diamond as well as fortune. And it's, I mean, such an amazing example to me of that. Um, somebody able to bring this whole, you know, realm of imagination, you know, into reality. Um, diamonds then ruled by this Mercury in Libra. Um, which is in, again, the 11th house of good fortune. So again, it's very, you know, striving in this good diamond kind of way and being inspired and bringing the people, you know, connecting with the people and the, the uh, friendships and, you know, Frank Oz and everybody else that, that he connects with that, that comes together to make all this happen. 
It's a mercury that's rising away from the beam, beams of the sun, becoming visible. It has a phosis um, intensification, and it's in the same sign as Venus. It's Venus ruling that 11th house. So that definitely also brings in this that artistic um, quality and that very charming quality he has. Um, fortune, the ruler of fortune and being Jupiter and Sagittarius in its own sign, in an angular sign near the ascendant. Again, just extremely powerful. So this is just sort of showing um, in this way, um, we you, a lot of the stuff you'd maybe already be kind of noticing about the chart because you wouldn't have to have these things on here and you'd, you'd notice, oh, he's got Jupiter ruling the ascendant really close to the ascendant and his 10th whole sign house is ruled by that Mercury. But because the lots are cast into these same angular houses, they are just, all these concepts we're talking about are just like really reinforced you know, and we see this person doing very um, remarkable things with their with their soul intention. You, you know, this is an example is the person as a young teenager has this dream and, you know, makes that dream happen. So when we're talking about the fortune charts, like I was just talking a little bit there, um, we're basically making the lot of fortune the ascendant. And this is, again showing this web of relations, events, causes, influences, being in the right place at the right time, you know, how how do you how do you fit within that turning wheel? You, you know, there there's some sort of and the way that I think about this is is um especially the way diamond comes into it, I personally don't see everything as being completely predetermined, but I do believe in things like um, destiny and different layers of fate that are all operating at the same time. And this is the idea to me of, um, to bring all these things together with a fortune chart is, you know, how do you, how do you claim that destiny? You know, how do you step into this? You, you know, there's, there's definitely sort of binding constraining quality because there's something you have to sort of fit in to, but you know, how, how do you go about making that happen? Um, and again, like with somebody like Jim Henson, we can see when when these things are, when strong placements that are angular, like in that 10th place from fortune, like he has here with um, Jupiter and Sagittarius ruling a lot of fortune in the 10th place from fortune, that's extremely powerful. Um, the other point that's really powerful in the Hellenistic text is the 11th place from fortune. Um, it's called the place of acquisition. Again, you wanna look at the Lord of Fortune and when we're talking about the, the zodiacal releasing technique, um, this is a timing technique that then sort of takes that fortune chart and animates it, you know, and, and shows how these periods of time are going to play out over time around all these same themes. Um, and relative to that 11th place of acquisition, um, one reason it may be so important is because, of course, the 11th place is the place of the good daimon. It's that place that's, you know, rising up um, out of the underworld across, you know, the horizon, like the rising sun, and is rising up, you know, toward culminating towards the midheaven and has that good daimon association. And so that condition of that 11th place, as well as the ruler of that 11th place becomes extremely important regarding prosperity, acquisition of things, um, I think you can also really bring it into like the certain type of calling um, a person might might have, and you know, and you, you know that being really strong can really help somebody out. And that that um, that place and ruler having difficulties is going to be showing you know difficulties that person has to surmount and kind of work through and overcome. With the diamond charts, um, Vedius Valens does talk about the, them, and in in many ways he's using them to show how your character, your intention, the mindset you have, how they're interacting with the events brought by fortune, the sort of intersection between chance and intention. There is not as much out there um, that I've seen though in the Hellenistic text, like talking about these charts. It's not, they're not given the same um, attention that a lot of fortune charts are given. Um, but somebody that whose ideas about this I've always really loved is um, Robert Hand. Um, I forget what year it was exactly. It might've been, I want to say it was 2017, maybe it was 2016. 
but Robert Hand gave a talk at NORWAC, the Northwest Astrology Conference, um, about the lot of spirit charts or the lot of diamond charts. And he called this the chart of the higher self. I'm sure you can um, purchase this from the NORWAC site if you're interested in it. And he talked about using this chart, again, making the daimon the ascendant. This is showing this idea of the higher self, however you want to talk about that. And one 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 uh, interpretation guideline he had that I really love was saying, you know, there, there's no bad aspects. You need to look at this as, as you know, embodying... Um, your higher self. That being said, you you certainly could also use these charts just to show, you know, there's some difficult aspects, you know, different aspects of somebody's character that are kind of working themselves out and there might be some tension and that sort of thing. Um, again, you also want to really look at the Lord of that lot of diamond and um, similar to the lot, the Lord of the lot of fortune, as well as the Lord of the ascendant, that's going to show something really important about who the person is, but especially in terms of their character and these sort of inner motivations and that sort of thing. Um, just where I am with time, I know I'm, I've, I've gone on a while here and I have some more examples. Are there any like questions people have that I should answer right now before going yeah, forward? If you like, we could do a bit of a Q&A session after you finish with the exam. Okay. Is that okay with you? I want to respect your time, so you let us know. <laughs> okay, cool. I could yeah. listen to this for hours, so thank you so much. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's there's so much to say about this topic. Um, it's it's definitely challenging. Um, fitting it into a webinar like this format, definitely something that could be a whole long workshop type of thing, or obviously a course. Um. So one of my favorite charts to use, um, if you've seen me do talks, you've probably seen me use um, Kurt Cobain. Um, it was mentioned at the start, I live in Olympia um, and um, that's where um, Kurt Cobain was living, where he, where he really developed his uh, musical career. If you're not familiar with Kurt Cobain in the um, late 80s, and, but especially in the early 90s, he became a uh, very prominent um, post-punk musician that became very associated with the Seattle, Washington um, grunge music scene. Although when he was rising, he was you know actually living in Olympia and very connected to the Olympia um, punk, post-punk um, right girl scene here that was happening at the time. And again, when we're talking about somebody that has a dream and uh, brings that dream into reality in this really massive way, this is um, a prime example of somebody like this who from a young from a young age gets this um, sort of burning vision of what he wants to do in the world and is is hyper focused on it. And um, makes it happen um, in a way we haven't seen since because um, it was, you know, it was the last time Saturn was in Aquarius and then went into Pisces. And um, I keep looking around in the popular culture, like, can we get another Kurt Cobain or somebody just to come through and, and smash the music scene open and open up all these um, artists that are doing more um, to me, interesting, um, experimental, passionate forms of music, you know, that aren't on the major labels. It's, a, it's just a phenomenon that, at the time that's, that's really pretty remarkable um, that, you know, if you're my age, I was in high school when this happened, um, you really had to live through that time period um, to know um, what that was like. You know, it was an era of um, these hair metal bands. Um, some metal bands were definitely good, and there was definitely some really good popular hip hop, but there was also a lot of really not good um, commercial pop that was dominating. And um, he, there's a way that he just completely um, blew that all open with his his music. And uh, at the same time, we're we're talking about somebody when we're talking about soul. You know, this was a tortured soul. Um, this is somebody that grew up um, in a difficult family, his fa parents separating at a young age, who experienced abuse, who experienced homelessness as a um, teenager, 
who, you know, had to learn how to fend on his own, um, but was an extremely talented artist, extremely talented musician, um, you know, struggled making money. Uh, when he lived in Olympia, he talked about, you know, just having enough money to maybe go to the, the local convenience shop and buy a corn dog. And that was what he was going to eat that day. And, um, you know, wasn't seen as somebody that knew how to make money or, or just get a job and kind of fit in in that way, but would do things, you know, like maybe like go to the Goodwill and buy a bunch of objects and then make some kind of like um, sculpture or art piece out of that, um, you know, just really following his own passions. But even though he he could be portrayed as somebody, if you just saw him as only oh, like this downcast person not doing anything, um, he was known as being hyper focused on the music, um, really intensely wanting to practice, really driving his bandmates to practice, and really in a very Virgo ascendant way, you know, having this perfection of form and music that he wanted to see, and he expected everybody else to live up to around him, and. Um, also, you know, you see interviews, he's this pretty mellow, um, humorous, ironic kind of personality. He steps on stage, he's on a rock god trip, you know, he's literally kind of like this daimon um, coming alive on stage that had this, in this incredible power that was um, being channeled and transmitted through him. So in his chart, um, we have another um, night chart here. And we have basically, you know, Pisces Sun, Cancer Moon. So we know we got a trine. Um, and in this case, it's, a you know, about 12 or so, 10, 12 degrees or so past the exact trine. <clears throat> um, but remember, he's born at night. And so even though he's a Pisces Sun and we um, he's very Pisces and I think all of us associate him with being Pisces, this cancer mean is actually the sect light. Um, it's in its own domicile. It's extremely important um, to his chart. It's in the 11th house of the good diamond. It's also in the same sign as Jupiter retrograde and cancer. Jupiter is the exaltation. Um, Jupiter in cancer is the ex exaltation of Jupiter. But again, we're talking about, you know, um, when I mentioned the thing about, you know, contrary to sect, it's Jupiter but, you know, we might have somebody here being a night chart with a Jupiter going to excess at times, you know, not having a sense of the uh, kind of boundaries, um, which we know, you know, he, he does have that um, with things that happen to him. Um, and, but anyway, so for the um, fortune, <clears throat> um you know, doing the same calculation we've done before, the, the lot of fortune, I don't need to step, walk you all through that again. The lot of fortune ends up being in the ninth house in Taurus, very close to the north node of the moon. So this is really interesting where we have this, this lunar lot that we're casting from the ascendant, um, which would be, you know, going from the moon to the sun. It's ending up right at that that this lunar point of the point of the the moon, you know, rising across the ecliptic, um, and so th there's a real concentration here in a, in a really powerful way here. That's maybe um, even more so intensifying this um, fortune quality. Now, as opposed to um, um, Jim Henson. We do not see these lots in angular places in the natal chart. So these are, this is the, the lot of fortunes in the ninth house. So that's a cadent house falling off an angle. The lot of diamond is here in Aquarius. That's also a cadent house falling off an angle. So there is also something here about somebody who's kind of, you know, definitely in between, you know, and maybe this, this speaks to, um, some of his difficulties in life and as well as, you know, the need to really embark and, you know, follow his own path in life, which, which is not like the normal way of doing things. Um, but we can see that this lot of fortune is ruled by an exalted Venus um, in Pisces, which is in an angular house. So there is actually this, this angularity 
in the natal chart, um, it's coming though through um, Venus ruling the lot of fortune. Um, we can talk about that more in a second. A lot of diamond Aquarius ruled by Saturn and Pisces, also an angular house. And in fact, we have the rulers of fortune and diamond um, coming together. And you may know, you know, as far as his life, um, he was one of the major stories of Saturn being in Pisces um, last time, especially in the way that there's great things about Saturn and Pisces that he's an example of in terms of incredible creativity and imagination. There can also be extremely upsetting, emotional, um, drenching, melancholic events that happen. Um, and of course, he had the tragic um, suicide death um, that happened during that Saturn return that, that he experienced at that time. But we think about, you know, Daimon, Aquarius, Saturn. I mean, I think if you ever see him talk, he has that. He's Pisces, but he's got that, you know, incredibly um, dry wit and sense of irony. And there's something, you know, in a Saturn way, just like methodical, steady. Obviously, he, he at one point has this huge success, but he was just kind of plowing through like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, just working really, really steadily for that calling he had that I think are, are very Saturnine qualities that we can see are very um, important to the soul. Um, and so if we go to the fortune chart, so now we're going to make the lot of fortune, the ascendant, and we can see the ruler, where's the ruler? The ruler is um, Venus and Pisces in that 11th house of the good diamond. So we would just normally think that's that's positive. Um, now, of course, there is this Saturn element, um, which is which, especially being born at night, um, again, could be some issues around you know boundaries, as well as extreme you know depression. He was known to have um, really ex that that source of melancholia, which was which was probably also a real creative gift. Um, you know, also just really tormented him and, you know, he really suffered from, a um, heroin addiction and, and many issues around things like that. Um, however, you know, Venus being in, um, exalted in the 11th place of acquisition that does at the same time show this real, um, you know, real, real power of, of success, which we can see being part of, of what happened for him. Plus that, that Venus is ruled by this exalted, um, Jupiter. Um, Jupiter can also see, um, fortune. Um, plus, you know, as already mentioned, you know, his sec light being there. Um, and also, at the same time, we can see, you know, you, you always want to look at all of the fortune angles are going to be really important. There's nothing up here, down here, but we can see in Aquarius, you know, the lot of spirit is angular to fortune. And so, remember, we saw before they were they're in these cadent natal houses, but Daimon being angular to fortune is, again, going to show somebody that... Um, maybe in that kind of metacosmos in between worlds kind of place of cadency that we see in the natal chart is going to um, still be able to get inspired by the events of fortune coming through and really make things happen. And you can think about, you know, when did he get super famous? It was when Saturn was transiting through Aquarius um, in the 10th house from fortune. Um, but we do see over here, we got Neptune, angular to fortune, and Scorpio, as well as the lunar nodes, um, which I think definitely we could bring into the whole interpretation about his personality, as well as Mars and Scorpio. Um, so, you know, Mars and Scorpio, this is a day chart. We, we, we would interpret that as being um, more difficult. Um, being a night chart with Mars and Mars, and especially Mars at the beginning of Scorpio, a lot of you may know by essential dignity is just extremely powerful. It's like the most powerful place for Mars. It's got bounds, face, domicile, um, triplicity. And um, 
So this is, you know, really showing a lot of um, power of Mars coming through, I think, with him being such a survivor. Um, however, you know, there's going to be obviously it's connected to the nodes. You know, I th we can also think about um, different, you know, difficulties he, he went through related to that. It's part of his personality. And I want to move on, actually, because of how much time I'm taking up with this. I'm going to do a few other examples. So if we look at his diamond chart, I had to switch to Astro C because I couldn't figure out how to do this otherwise. Um, um, so on Astro Seek, you can, you can actually use the free Astro Seek program. You, it's wonderful because you can actually use it to calculate um, a lot of diamond chart, making it the first house. So we see here in the diamond chart, uh, we would have um, Aquarius rising. He has a lot of diamond right there, um, ruled by that Saturn in Pisces, which is down here in the um, second house. And so there might be something here just showing, you know, this real sense of livelihood and resources in a Piscean way um, that he's operating with. Um, we also could take into account the fact that Saturn and Pisces can't see. Um, there's not a major aspect going there. So maybe that's a bit of a blind spot with the way his soul and intentions are operating. In addition to Saturn being, you know, the contrary to Sec Malefic, as I've mentioned. Um, and one thing that we also can see again, you know, Mars becomes very angular in Scorpio up here at the top of the chart. So if we think about, you know, as this soul and higher self, that that Mars and Scorpio with the South Node and Neptune is just extremely important to um, who he is on this, on this soul level. And um, I think, again, really makes a lot of sense as far as somebody who's such a survivor, who really kind of cleaves, you know, through this corporate music industry, um, to open up this whole strange quality of time that happened back then where all these bands um, started getting um, signed and able to make some money that normally weren't able to, the major labels and that sort of thing. The music industry was obviously totally different back then too. Um, and if we do, I've, I've mentioned before Zodiacal releasing. So one of the things about Zodiacal releasing is um, you're basically animating the chart and especially if you're, if you're releasing from Daimon, and you're going to then create these um, these time periods. And one of the things about Kurt Cobain and who he is as a soul operating on that level, you know, he's got an Aquarius um, Daimon, which is a 30 year period. It's 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 Aquarius is the longest um, planetary period in zodiacal releasing. So that basically means on this level one. Um, he starts out in this 30, he's going to have to live through this 30 year um, Saturn period, which basically, you know, he, he, he doesn't live through that. It, so his entire um, life is basically contained within this, um, this sad, this opening Saturn period um, with even, you know, like the Saturn return happening at the end of his life. Um, and so there, there's definitely something um, um telling about that in some kind of, in, in a lot of ways that we could talk about. Um, Nina Simone, um, where I talked about her some, just to go into her chart in this way, if we do the fortune chart, what we see is in the natal chart, she's Aquarius rising with Saturn and Aquarius, Venus and Aquarius, very strong Saturn ruling this, this moon. The moon in Capricorn is opposite its domicile. It's in the 12th house. However, that moon in Capricorn is plus it's a it's a waning uh, you know balsamic dark moon that's even heading towards an eclipse um, opposite Pluto. However, that moon is um, has Jupiter in a superior trine, um, also interacting with Mars, which is which is which is also of the nocturnal sect, but. And, and we can see with her moon, um, she was just this, this incredible worker who like um, 
just practice constantly, performed constantly. Um, it's why she's just really a, a singular genius. Um, if you haven't ever watched any kind of video recording of her performing, you you, you should. I mean, there's nobody else um, like her. And so what we can see when we look at the fortune chart is how this, this moon that's in the 12th house that, you know, in some ways you could see maybe it has some issues going on with it. It becomes in this place of um, acquisition. Um, and so the sec light ends up in there. And one of the things about her um, is that she, that, that, that goes with this and goes with, um, you know, the lot of fortune being in Pisces with, Mercury and Pisces being in fall and being opposite its domicile and being ruled by Jupiter in Virgo, also opposite its domicile over here with Mars and Neptune and South Node. You might know that her music just became very much synonymous and caught up in the civil rights movement. And um, when she was first becoming really famous, she didn't quite realize that. And and but the civil rights activists were listening to her music and then she got really um fully involved um in this major way even even writing specific um civil rights music and so there's a very kind of like lunar um for the people and and fighting against um racism and 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 really being a fighter in this this Mars Jupiter way you know who's channeling this this um spiritual quality through her um, music. Also, the and the thing about this too is with Jupiter ruling um, the lot of fortune over here, one thing that, that so, you know, say there's some good things with Jupiter being there, um, but at the same, because Jupiter's angular, we're putting a benefic angular to fortune but um, in that seventh house quality, she did have some, her relationships are just very important to her. And, but she unfortunately at times w was involved in abusive relationships. Um, her marriage was abusive and he kind of controlled the finances and controlled the money and um, was, was also her manager. So she was sort of being performing to the point of exhaustion. Um, and, Later in her life, there's a whole bunch of other episodes of her getting caught up in different partnerships and sort of at times being having her, her power given away in some ways. Um, so there's some complicated things there that we can see coming in with that placement. But if we look at her um, lot of diamond chart and being Sagittarius rising, we then see that... Um, Jupiter and Virgo with the Mars, with the Neptune, with the South Node, all up here in the tenth house, and so this this really shows that sort of um, activist um, crusader in some ways that she became, um, and just um, really powerful figure with her music and everything. Um, another one I want to do, if I think I have time to do, is um, John Coltrane. Also, another singular musical genius who also who became um, was very spiritual. In fact, this is an image. There's actually like a church where they've made him into a saint, um, which I actually didn't realize until I was um, researching this. And you may know, you know, with a love supreme, um, it's basically a, like a prayer he wrote to God, where all the notes are like um, feeding into this. Again, this musical genius, similar to Nina Simone in growing up facing racism, um, being obsessed with music, known to just constantly practice. Um, there was a story of him um, being in like a hotel room and was told to keep it down and be quiet. He been, been, he, he, he practiced, would, would, would practice literally all day, like sleep with his horn. And um, he'd already been practicing, you know, for hours and hours. And after being told he had to be quiet, he just, the person in the room with him just saw him just, he just kept practicing his fingers, even though he couldn't play, he was going to like keep practicing that for like another hour. Um, we have this, this Pisces rising chart that has Jupiter and Aquarius in the 12th house. 
And this Jupiter and Aquarius is involved with a um, this fixed grand square or cross of Jupiter and Aquarius, Saturn and Scorpio, Mars and Taurus, Neptune and Leo. So Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars. I mean, it's it's very you know for this person that's just like fighting and practicing and and, and following this very um, path of of um, you know, someone that really ends up hearing this call of God and having this musical creative um, sort of obsession who ends up breaking a lot of ground with um, jazz. Um, he's part of like free jazz, avant-garde jazz, um, perform with all these really well-known different people like Miles Davis, Lonius Monk, Duke Ellington. Um, and we see in a way that, you know, we see fortune over here in the eighth house. We see um, a lot of diamond down here in the sixth house. Um, we wouldn't necessarily see those as being like favorable, you know, house topics. And one of the things I think is really interesting though, is, is this very liminal um, grand cross in these cadent houses, you know, actually become extremely angular. They are angular to the diamond. And Neptune's in the same sign of the daimon. And so I just think that really shows this um, sole purpose of being in between these worlds and, and going out to do these really um, far, having this far out vision and ear and sense of um, every, he was known to like um, be in, into all sorts of religions and different forms of spirituality even astrology and um, it all kind of came together in, in through his music that was really sort of like trying to um, it's hard to, it's hard to try to describe what he was doing actually. Um, but we can see when we're looking at this, some things are going to start showing up, you know, what the ruler of diamond is this sun and fall in Libra. So it's in fall, but it's also at the cardinal axis right at zero Libra and it's right with fortune. So um, there is like a connection there. Um, and in fact, when we look at that 11th place, it is the sun and the sun is then in, you know, it's angular to fortune, you know, right there with Mercury. Um, and again, we think about like the, the Agathos Daimon and this, this deep spirituality and, um, how, and, you know, even think about Neptune being in that same sign as Daimon and how that's really coming through um, his music. Um, and if we look at the Daimon chart, um, the Daimon chart is obviously ruled um, by um, that sun, <clears throat> which ends up down here in the third house with a lot of fortune and Mercury. Um, so we could think about that re related to um, all the different music scenes, like local music scenes that he gets into. But this is also traditionally the house of the goddess. And it is that sort of more personal relationship with spirit. And which I think, you know, really comes through with his syncretism of his spirituality. Um, and, also, though, what we could see, you know, this is also somebody, we can see these hard aspects, though, too, right? Because with a lot of diamond, we got Mars up here in the 10th house. We got Saturn down here, this Mars-Saturn opposition, which is really angular to the diamond, um, plus Jupiter being over here that rules its ascendant. Another person, you know, like Kurt Cobain, and actually Nina Simone, um, but specifically like Kurt Cobain, also fell into a heroin uh, addiction, definitely had things to overcome in that way. But um, it said in 1957, he had this massive um, spiritual realization, which was part of him just quitting heroin. And like the voice of God came to him. And this is what sort of heightened his his uh, spiritual devotion and how that comes through his music in the years ahead. Um, and interestingly about, if you just look at um, that year of 1957, when this happens, just just to throw out a few different timing techniques and how you can look at this, it was a um, would have moved in between like a seventh house and an eighth house year, and so we'd we'd have um, 
Virgo, you know, ruled by this Mercury and Libra that's with the fortune being activated, um, as well as um, the eighth house where he has fortune would have, would have become activated, ruled by that Venus. Um, plus in that year of 1957, we don't really have a date, but Jupiter was in Libra. So Jupiter would have been transiting through his eighth house in one way. So that also is like a dark night of the soul, hearing God kind of experience, but also relative to fortune, that would have been the lot of fortune house. And um, if we furthermore go through his um, zodiacal releasing from Daimon, he would have already been through a Leo period. He would have been in a Virgo period on level one when this happened, um, which would have been ruled by that Mercury, you know, with Libra that would have also been getting that Jupiter and Libra transit at the time. And then on level two, there would have been a movement from um, Taurus into um, Gemini, which again would just go back to activating the same thing with the uh, with with the rulers of fortune and the Mercury in in Libra, and so anyway, th there's some things like that where you can start looking at when things happen and how these things might all um, end up coming together um, into some sort of big epiphany that makes a big difference in their life. I think I'm, I I have more examples, but I think I'm getting pretty close to time, and I probably have to stop here i'm guessing is that right uh, I, again we could listen to you all day if you want to use more examples i'm fine that's up to you <laughs> okay um maybe i'll just do this one is kind of quick that for people that don't know the people i'm talking about i, I wanted to throw in a a current celebrity um partially because my my daughters who are in um, well, one's already graduated college and the one's still in college when they were back visiting me over the holidays we went to go see the Wonka movie starring Timothy Chalamet. I wasn't expecting much from it. And I was like, wow, Timothy Chalamet actually pulled that off, like surprisingly better in a musical than I was um, expecting. And I've also just, you know, I'm, I'm not a big Timothy Chalamet fan necessarily, but I've just, you know, over the past years, just been like, like, who is this person? Just, you know, they're in like every major movie, it seems like, and especially in terms of um, big roles and, and well-known directors, um, in some cases, some of the more talented directors, you know, wanting to uh, work with him. And, you know, he's played people like um, King Henry V, you know, who is famous for that St. Crispin's Day speech um, in Shakespeare. And obviously he's playing Paul Atreides, you know, in, in, in these Dune films. And he's all of a sudden, you know, on one hand, he's, he's, he's singing and dancing as Willy Wonka. And now, you know, a few months he's going to show up as, you know, Paul Atreides, you know, like leading this massive military, you know, operation taking over the universe or whatever. But, um, any, and so I don't know as much about him. And the other thing is, you know, this is something that comes up using these techniques. Some of those other examples I've mentioned, um, we know what happened to these people. Um, to me, the we, we really don't. He's, he's really young. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with his story or where he's going. You know, right now, as I'm talking, he's at this kind of pinnacle of fame. Everyone's talking about, you know, he's such a great leading man and people seem to enjoy working with him in his films and everything like that and so i'm just looking at this a little bit more i'm just curious like well what's going on um with some of this that, that we can see um you know with this chart so we see here somebody he's a capricorn sun but he is born at night and we see there's this massive capricorn lineup though in his chart of sun Mars exalted in Capricorn, Mercury in Capricorn with Neptune and Uranus all in Capricorn. So this is a very, you know, one of these people that there's a lot of people that, that are born with this Neptune Uranus combination. This is somebody who's obviously generate generationally stepped into it uh, as a representation and in a very like house of good fortune, Agatha Tyche, uh, fifth house um, type of way. Uh, but the actual sect light would be this moon in Pisces, which is very angular, moving away from Saturn in Pisces, um, somebody that's going through his um, 
Saturn return. And, you know, one thing about that, the, 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 the Wonka movie, you know, it wasn't, it's not the greatest movie in, in the world, but there was one point in the movie where I was like, well, this is actually better than I was expecting. And what it really reminded me of for a moment was, um, Mary Poppins in the way of, um, if you've researched Saturn and Pisces, the a uh, couple of cycles ago in the sixties when Saturn was in Pisces, um, the Mary Poppins movie came out and, and Julie Andrews played Mary Poppins and Julie Andrews also has Saturn and Pisces. And it's just a very Saturn and Pisces um, type of story. And the, the Wonka movie had a bunch of stuff like that also going on. And, you know, it's also a musical and he has Saturn and Pisces. And I was just, no, it was a, there's an interesting thing where I was just, there was a connection there that I was um, seeing. And, and we, we see this in his chart with, with them being so um, angular. Um, and of course, you know, Mercury rules that ascendant, um, you know, connecting to all this, this Capricorn stuff. But what really starts showing up um, when you look at, um, the fortune chart now now mercury is actually over here in the fortune chart um in the eighth house from fortune so can't see fortune a bit of a blind spot there's sort of um contra antitia at least by sign you know probably borderline what you consider to be the the um the uh orb for contra antitia but that could be some actual mitigation, though, if you can give them that uh, contraintitia, which would also honestly make a lot of sense with um, all the success he's already having. But what we definitely see with this is that Saturn and Pisces and that sect light of the moon become um, really angular in the fortune chart. And then that the 11th place from fortune is Aries, ruled by that Mars in Capricorn. And um, although, again, in the eighth house, the Mars in Capricorn is um, in a, in that's a closer contra uh, Mercury is not really, you know, in a very close orbit. Actually, now I'm looking again, nobody would actually probably say that except by whole sign contra -antitia. But Mars is more the one that's a little bit in the, the borderline of that. Um, but what's, what's interesting about this Mars exalted in Capricorn ruling that 11th place of acquisition is, is that's one of the sides where, where it was making me realize, you know, wow, that's, that really goes with these big action roles he's having. But you really see this in the Daimon chart because in the Daimon chart, this is a Scorpio rising person that is then, you know, that Daimon chart is ruled by this exalted Mars um, that's with Mercury. Um, which is also the ascendant ruler, um, and um, that sect light and Saturn end up then being in the the fifth house of good fortune too. So, um, yeah, that was that was basically it for that one. I think I'm, I know that I'm so. I'm going to do one more, really quick, just to give you another feel hopefully it's helpful for people just starting to understand this just to get a little bit of sense of of these examples so um audrey hepburn um is a query hopefully you know who audrey hepburn is famous um actress who then later in her life um when she has children she sort of actually removed herself from hollywood in many ways and then eventually became this person um involved in um, going into third world uh, uh, countries with UNICEF and having um, providing food to people that are starving, um, being a big focus of her life. And what's really significant about that, and when, when you look at her chart being Saturn and Aquarius and Saturn and Capricorn rise, uh, ruling that, um, <clears throat> as well as in the fortune chart you know it's it's got the taurus it's ruled by the venus and aries and the 12th from fortune um, that's ruled by this mars and fall and cancer squaring that venus um even though she had enormous success in her life um you may know that she lived through the period of um, nazi occupation 
where people were, including herself, were being um, starved and, and cut off from food. And, um, you know, in some way, that was probably some kind of incredible driving force for her through the early part of her career. Um, but it's it's really interesting then that um, this ends up becoming this big calling that she then does later in her life. And when you look at her natal chart, you know, the sec, the sect light is in um, Pisces and the second house. Um, and, and um, but in the fortune house, fortune chart, it is in the place of acquisition in the 11th house. And I think that really shows that's, that's ruled by um, Jupiter and Taurus. Um, that's here in the angular fortune house. Um, so that part of it, I think just really shows that, um, I mean, she was always just like this bright light, um, always lighting up every, you know, every screen she was on and every scene, you know, there, there's a certain quality she has, um, as an actress, which is, you know, very much a part of why she's such a, um, became such a Hollywood, um, icon that um i think you can see there and when you um look at her oh i don't have her diamond chart on here that was it that was that's messing me up but when you look at her diamond chart so if we're looking at her needle chart she has diamond in the 11th it's very close to the midheaven and it's ruled by that jupiter and taurus which is actually very angular in the natal chart um, and it's also in the same sign as fortune. So that's also um, really showing this person that can have the like the kind of big soul intention and vision and, you know, make it happen. But when you look, one thing I noticed when I was looking at her zodiacal releasing is that um, because she starts off in Daimon with um, Sagittarius, that she then lives through this Capricorn period, um, which is a natal 12th house. And um, it's also not a, it's a natal 12th house, but it's also not a fortune house. This was actually the period where all the, where, where what, we, what we think of Audrey Hepburn as being um, her great fame um, being. Um, and when she's in the Aquarius period, which would be the first natal house angular Plus, it is the tenth house from Fortune Angular. We zodiac releasing. You know, you're taught that's supposed to be like the, this big major peak period. Um, the thing that what what happens in that period towards the end of her life is when she steps into this role of um, helping to distribute food and uh, working to help eradicate people starving in the world. And I. I think what part of what we could see with that is there's well obviously there's the diamond in the in the house of the good diamond but Jupiter ruling that would be in the sixth place from diamond and the sixth place um, among other things can definitely be somebody that can work to um, work work against um, forms of systemic oppression. And especially a benefic planet being down there, you know, doing something to help out in that way. And so um, I think that is something that you can really see, you know, that being more of her um, soul calling in that way. Also, the fact we could say, um, you know, Jupiter ruling Diamond in her natal fourth house, you know, once she had children, she... Um, increasingly stepped away from doing film, you know, and focused on having her family. And, 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 you know, she had a lot of really difficult relationships until the end of her life. But, um, I don't, there's something about that, that wanting that, that intention to focus on her home. Um, and, you know, not so much the trying to just keep getting out there and take whatever role she could sort of thing that I think, um, really speaks to, Jupiter being the ruler of Diamond down there. So anyway, yeah, I can definitely take um, then any questions people have. And, um, you know, just to mention this again, there is a Zodiacal releasing course I'm going to be um, doing through Kepler College in another month. And there's actually advanced pricing available for that right now. 
and um, there's still spots opening. We already have a good sized class from what I've seen, but there is room for more people to be in the class if you're interested. Um, definitely look into that. And yeah, let me know if there's any questions people have. Wow, great. What an absolutely wonderful, visually stunning presentation with such informative slides and fascinating chart examples. Thank you for taking that extra time to share with that today. Absolutely wonderful. I will apologize in advance. We don't have time for an extensive Q&A, but I've actually had to get a separate sheet of paper to condense some of these questions. <laughs> so we'll try and get to as many as we can. We've got many hearts and claps coming through. Absolutely amazing presentation. So just to condense some of these questions down, what uh, and forgive me if you've answered some of these questions already. I've had to be in the background writing these down. In terms of orbs, what what orbs do you use in terms of looking at the the lots and the connections? Um, well, for the lots, um, I would say give an example of somebody that we did mm -hmm. earlier. Um, you know, so let's go to Kirk Cobain. Um, I first of all with the lots, I would use whole whole sign aspects so um let's say with um a lot of fortune you know the fact that jupiter and the moon can see it by sextile the fact that all the pisces can see it by sextile the fact that all the scorpio is opposite it the fact that the virgo is trining it i would i would factor all of that in. Um, but then if you want to get a little bit more like what's really coming through here more closely, I do like the idea also of, you know, maybe in his case, it would be the the moon um, has the tighter, you know, this is like a two within three degree aspect from the moon to fortune and the moon, the um, fortune is also in the um, even more so fortune being in the, in the exaltation of the moon. But um and also, you know, the North Node is being re is really close there. So I would also really factor that in. So um, I would do both, if that makes sense. Um, the the actual condition of the house it's in and that sign, I think, is important. You can you can actually use whole sign aspects, but if you want to kind of um, try to drill down on what's the more what's really coming through that lot more, you want to. I would go with like the, the closest aspect you have. Um, I don't think I have any, yeah, that, hopefully that, let me know if that's not clear enough. I, I love your Kurt Cobain example, such a grunge fan, absolutely wonderful. Charlie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do you incorporate uh, asteroids into your work when looking at the lots as well? You know, if you have an asteroid that's like right on. I mean, I think it would, you'd have to give it like a degree or two at the most. Um, but if it's within a couple degrees, um, I, I think you can, you can use that. Um, I wouldn't go, I guess the way I would think about that, especially related to Daimon is if, well, I mean, just first of all, one of the ways Demetra George has framed, um, asteroids is that they have a daimonic quality and i i think that's a very good um way to work with them because of there being so many of them and they're they are like these intermediary um entities you know in between the the, the realms of the, the planets and just where that asteroid belt is um located as she describes in the asteroid goddess book i've always really loved that um, I think rather than just going crazy with all the asteroids being that at, at that particular degree um, is if there's something that just really um, speaks to you. And I think especially if there is a mythic figure or perhaps it's a name or a location, I guess also, but something that's, that's really strikes you as this like deep, there's something about your soul that is really moved by um, this figure. And then their asteroid is like right at your um a lot of diamond or fortune that's what i would especially um take as being significant and i know and not everybody thinks i i don't think everybody's in agreement that you can use fixed stars but um the more and more i've looked at fixed stars and i'm i my, myself have gone back and forth when i was younger on this with like can you really count you know projecting them onto the ecliptic where it doesn't really make sense and 
some cases like something like algal that's like so far off the ecliptic like why would we look at that projected degree but the fact that things really they do appear to really come through those projected degrees those like mori right as we're been talking about so like if the if the lot's like right on that projected degree with again like within a one or two orb um i would definitely consider it and um there might be something there for you to um discover um with, with all the, the constellation of meaning that you can bring in with that which you would also do with the the asteroid i would just look at all the mythic different layers of mythology and just see what what really speaks to you absolutely wonderful and forgive me if you've answered these questions before but in terms of, of sinistry say you may have someone's lot of, of diamond mm -hmm. conjunct at you know, a particular angle or planet yeah uh, how do you work how do you work with that yeah that would be significant i mean i didn't mention this um but valens um i think it's valens i hope someone correct me if i'm wrong but i it's I think it's Valens or is it Maternus? Maybe it's actually Maternus, but um, so there's, a the <laughs> there's a Hellenistic astrologer. There's a astrologer that uh, identifies um, fortune. I think it might be Maternus actually. Is that is like the uh, passions of a you know you know a man towards a woman, and that but then Daimon or spirit would be the passions of a woman towards a man and. Um, I don't think you need to, to gender that in that way. That's obviously coming from a certain framework of, of, of looking at the lots. And you might, some of you might know that there's even ways to calculate a lot of different lots that are based upon gender in Hellenistic astrology, but that's, that's definitely in there. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it they definitely do. Um, I mean, there are things like the lot of Eros that would be, that's known as, or the lot of Cupid, that's like the lot of Venus. And a lot of people use that for relationships. But really when you, when you, when you, when you're reading, especially a lot of fortune, I guess, like that's very um, all about the body and the pleasures of the body, which is obviously including relationships. And then um, Daimon would be very much, it would make me think in Sinistry, there's something of, this soul, this, however, that's tapping into this inner soul quality you have. Um, there's something about that partner's placement that's, that's near the lot of diamond that would be connected to that is, is how I would interpret that. But yeah, I definitely think it's something that you can look at. Wonderful. For everyone asking those questions, pull up your charts and have a look. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. And uh, forgive me if I'm framing this, uh, if I'm not framing this question correctly, there's a few people in the chat talking about either being born at sunrise or sunset. And I think mm. referring back to the, the calculations of the diurnal and the, the nocturnal calculations and maybe your thoughts uh, there. I don't know if you're understanding my question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's it, it's kind of a problem. And I had meant to say this. I'm glad that came up to you. I'll, I'll answer that question in a second, but something I meant to say is the time charts are really important when you're working with this because um, and even some of the examples I use, which, which they say they're double A ratings, like Nina Simone and John Coltrane, they're just like, I think Nina Simone's like 6 PM and Coltrane's like 3 AM or 3 PM or something. Um, if that is actually off at all, you know, it can actually completely throw off the calculations of the lots, which is a problem because of how much it does. A lot of these interpretations are based upon the sign they're in. And then obviously, like you're, like you're saying, whether or not to use the day formula or the night formula is also going to completely flip them around. Um, one thing about that is, though, I would keep in mind the fact that that quote I shared earlier by Doreen Greenbaum that I do really like about how you really need to interpret them all together anyway. And they are also sometimes used interchangeably for the, some of the same topics. And with the with Zodiac releasing, for example, you're going to be releasing, you can release from Fortune, releasing from both Fortune and Diamond are, are both important. Although the releasing from Diamond and Spirit has been the method that most people seem focused on talking about and wanting to use these days. Um, I know Chris Brennan has definitely brought up a lot of really good examples showing that there definitely could be nuance with that. And so if based upon 
his research, which what I've seen, I, I do like, um, it, it seems like it's definitely open to interpretation. I know there's some other people, um, such as, um, I've heard like Deborah holding, he's got a pretty hard line on that. And it's like, it's either rising or it's not. And if it's, if it's below the ascendant, it's a night chart. And so, um, I would, yeah, sorry. It's, it's, it's not something Maybe that for I those have to, a, to it's, work, a, it's a bit of a mystery, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> something else people. I meant to say, all this is a mystery. This is really stuff that's all about the mystery. So yeah. So just, just to try and see what works for people when they, when yeah, they yeah, yeah. Yeah, see which one maybe feels more like it's it's operating in more of the intentional intentional soul way. I guess that's that's the best way to try to separate them out. Is that the diamond's a little bit more the intention and the fortune's a little bit more like caught up in life events and things happening and that kind of thing. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, sorry, probably the last question for today. We had a few questions in terms of calculating. Now you said uh, astro seek. Um, where, where's the best place to look or maybe some of the um, places to click on? Because I don't believe Astro Gold, some people were saying, I don't think they have the, the calculation for the, the lot of diamond, if, if that's ah, correct. Um, they so do. Just, just the best way they, to, to calculate for, for people. Yeah, they do actually. Let me see oh, they if do? I okay. can pull it up. All right. So can everybody see my screen? I'm just sharing my... So... In Astro Gold, you got to go to displayed points and um, click on here and extra points. And I have it selected, but you, and if you didn't know this was here, I know when I finally realized this was here, I was like, I was like, I can't believe I did not know that was on Astro Gold, but it, it is. So you got to go to displayed points, hit extra points. They've got lots. Um, there's even one, oh, there's a bunch of them. Hellenistic Lots has them under Daimon, um, but you'll also find them under some of the other ones. I think, yeah, here there's a, it's called Spirit. So it's, it's actually gonna show up as both Spirit and Daimon. And I just, I liked having the Daimon on there. So that's what I have. So it, it does, and then it'll show up like this. So it'll say like DAI. Unfortunately though, Astro Gold that I'm aware of, and I'd love to hear if people know how to do this. I have not figured out how to get Astro Gold, nor um, uh, Solar Fire to calculate the, the diamond chart. But after Seek does, um, you got to go to traditional charts. And then there's like an alternate first house little thing to drop down to click on. And that's how you'll see that they have one that's like whole sign, like a lot of spirit or diamond or something like that. You just click on that and that, that's how you calculate it. Wonderful. Well, thank you for demonstrating. Marvelous. And I wonder if some of the people talking about Astro Gold, if they're not talking maybe about the full version, maybe just the the app on the phone. I'm I'm not quite sure. The app on the phone does not have it that I'm aware of. That that might be what it's is is referring to. Yeah. Thank you so much for for demonstrating that. Absolutely wonderful. Well, again, I apologize for everybody would not be able to get to every question today. We are well over time. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. An absolutely brilliant presentation. And of course, we've put the links in the chat box to your zodiacal releasing class that will be coming up and uh awesome. it's filling up quite fast right so <laughs> get yeah just as, a month as, away as soon as possible and i'll also note as well we're gonna the replay i'm gonna try and work on this and get it out um hopefully by monday the, the latest tuesday i'll get that on uh, as quickly as possible because i can't wait to watch the replay either so i'll try and get out yeah. as, as fast as possible <laughs> yeah thank you wonderful well thank you all so much for for coming today it's an absolutely brilliant presentation and uh, we love our wider worldwide community and part of the family, Kepler family. So thank you all so much for coming today. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Goodbye, everybody.